OK, welcome back. Let's return to Newcastle's takeover now and the human rights concerns surrounding it. The Premier League say they have received legally binding assurances the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will not control Newcastle. But even so, Saudi Arabia's involvement in the takeover has been condemned by human rights groups. Well, we can now speak live to Paul Brannigan, a senior lecturer in sport management and policy at Manchester Met University. Very good morning, Paul. Critics of this takeover have accused Saudi Arabia of using it as a chance to sport wash their reputation in the Western world. Can you just explain what exactly sports washing means, first of all? Yes, of course. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me on. So essentially, the idea of sports washing um, is nation states um, essentially trying to use sport and the excitement of sport and the passion um, involved in sport and sports sort of general, um, you know, great values um, and everything else to basically try and create a new image of themselves. Um, and in doing so, the ultimate goal um, essentially uh, is to move away from the sort of more negative stereotypes um, and values that international audiences might have of a country uh, and replace them uh, with much more positive values through cuddling up um, essentially to these great clubs, these various sports organisations um, that we love so much. We, we've been hearing about it quite a lot in recent years. I mean, how new a concept is it or, or are there examples kind of throughout history? Yeah, I mean, I think there certainly is. I'd say the actual, the, the, the term sports washing is relatively new. Um, it's another, another term that we constantly use is this idea of soft power, um, the way that states will try and use, for example, major sporting events um, to try and position themselves attractively in the eyes of international audiences. And we've seen that um, throughout history, states trying to do that. And of course, you know, one of the countries um, that's very close to Saudi Arabia is Qatar, um, who will look to be using the 2022 World Cup next year to do just that, to, to raise um, awareness of its existence, but also to paint a positive image of itself in audiences' heads. OK, Paul, Ed in the studio here. Sasha Deshmukh, who is uh, the interim chief executive officer of uh, Amnesty International, spoke to Sky Sports News, says that this is the worst place on earth to be a woman or a member of the LBGTQ plus groups. Why are human rights groups outraged? Is Sasha right in that assessment of the country? Well, yes. I mean, I think uh, given the sort of more Western version of democracy and human rights, I think Saudi Arabia um, certainly falls short. Most certainly, um, it's only in the last couple of years that women, for example, have been allowed to legally drive. Um, but there are still some significant homosexuality uh, and gender um, laws in the country, which are certainly questionable. Um, and, you know, not just Saudi Arabia, across the Persian Gulf, um, you know, even just on insulting the emir, for example, um, could lead to a prison sentence. So significantly different, the sort of more northern western version of, of, of democracy. Um, but look, yes, I mean, there, there certainly are uh, some human rights issues there, uh, but most certainly. And of course, that throws up some significant questions um, for both sports bodies and, of course, the Premier League as well. Yeah, there's been a lot of debate, hasn't there, about the actual extent of Saudi Arabia's involvement in the takeover. What do you make of it and why is that so key? Well, I think it's really key to understand who's actually ruling these, these Persian Gulf countries, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain or the UAE. Essentially, these countries end-to-end -end are run by family members. Um, so whether that be in the, the sector of culture, where sport obviously would fit, or whether that be politics, economics, um, or, or the more sort of social um, side of it, it's all being run essentially as part of one family. Um, so although, as we've been told legally, um, the you know, Saudi Arabia um, and the public investment fund are sort of you know, legally uh, two entities, I think it's very important to remember that, first of all, both culturally and politically, um, Saudi Arabia and the PIF are essentially going to be seen as the same organisation. But essentially, both the state and also its sovereign wealth fund are getting its money from the same place. So, like I said, legally, on paper, they might be separate entities, um, but I think that's very, very hazy, if I'm honest. OK, we heard Paul Amanda Staveley talk about the community and city of Newcastle just as much really as the football side of things in her interviews. Explain to us why she might be doing that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the city is going to be really key. Look, I mean, I think if, if you remove the pure human rights issues uh, for a second, you know, this the purchase of Newcastle United by Saudi Arabia is, is really strategic. I mean, you've got here a, a Premier League club, um, you know, the sort of pushing open door, really. Uh, Mike actually wanted to sell. Um, I've been watching Sky Sports, of course, for the last 24 hours, and you've shown various videos of fans celebrating. The city seems, you know, um, really excited about this. So I think it's a really good deal for Saudi. And I think previously there's been talk as well about, you know, Saudi Arabia will want to sort of use this, in, you know, similar to what we've seen here in Manchester City, where they don't just necessarily invest in Newcastle and St. James's Park, but they're also going to invest um, in the city um, as well. But again, you know, one could argue and, and be somewhat critical and say this is just another way potentially um, of Saudi Arabia sports washing, you know, using a sports club to try and improve its image elsewhere in the world. Just finally then, uh, how where do you think those fans are uh, of what Saudi Arabia and those other countries could be seen to be doing with this sports washing? I mean, we saw, as you say, the celebrations, but do you think they even really care? I mean, they just want their football team to win, don't they? Absolutely. And obviously, you know, crucial there is to mention the Newcastle fans are no different to any other fans. I think, you know, if you, if you went to Paris and you spoke to Paris Saint-Germain fans, I'm sure they would have a fairly positive uh, perspective on the Qatar owners, particularly how, you know, given they've just recently signed arguably the greatest player ever. Um, and sitting here in Manchester, again, very, very similar. You know, uh, Manchester City is loved. Uh, and I think the Abu Dhabi owners have, have looked on very favourably. So, look, I, I think at the end of the day, what we tend to see with this is if Newcastle go on and do very, very well over the next couple of seasons, and let's say, that, you know, that for example, they win a Premier League, I don't think the human rights issues in Saudi Arabia are going to be at the forefront of any fans' minds. Thanks very much for your time this morning. Thank you.